Welcome to Off Panel. Yo, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the artist of the Autumn Lands at Image Comics, as well as the creator of the glorious webcomic series, Tragedy Series. It's Benjamin Dewey. Thanks for coming on. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. So I have a whole slew of places I want to go with this interview, because, but because it's your first time on the show, I wanted to start at the beginning. Because, you know, I, I, as you know very well, comics is definitely something that lacks a truly traditional path. Everybody has their own answer. <laughs> but you, you started out as a musician. Like, before you were in comics, you were a music, musician. You know, what was your path to comics, and how did it end up being the right direction for you in the long run? Well, I, I think that... You know, part part of it is that as a kid, that was a thing that I was fascinated by. Drawing was my my first and main thing. But just like anybody, when you're young and you discover that, oh, you can have more than one passion. I discovered you know, guitar playing around the age of 13 or 14 and got really serious about it and badly wanted to be like Slash from Guns N' Roses and Steve Ray Vaughan and I think when I was about 17 or 18, I had this idea that I was going to be a real hotshot uh, guitar slinger type guy and put effort into that. I didn't really quite know how much effort was required, you know, or, or and I didn't I didn't have a model for how to hustle. Um, but, you know, I, you get into different things. I got into playing lap style slide guitar. And then that presented certain opportunities for me. And I was opening for different bands and things like that. And one of my favorite guitar players, this guy, Kelly Joe Phelps, he came through Cleveland where I lived uh, until I was 25. And he said, oh, you should move to Portland. Portland's a, a really good spot. Mm-hmm. And I was sort of going back and forth. I you know, I played music, but I was still trying to draw comics with a friend of mine, this guy, Nathan Staples, uh, who was writing stuff for me. And I moved to Portland because I thought, well, either way, if I play music for a living or I do comics for a living, Portland's the spot to go because Kelly Joe lives there. And, um, you know, Mike Mignola lived there. At least I thought he did. I knew Dark Horse was there. Mm -hmm. I had some vague sense that Oni was there, too. And um, so I moved out to Portland and you play enough gigs as as the decline of the CD is happening, mm-hmm. where you realize, okay, well, there's no real way to make money at this in a sustainable way, unless you want to go on tour and sell T-shirts. Um, it's just there's no scarcity of like once a file is on the internet, that's it. Yeah, people don't treat comics the same way. So as much as I love playing music, it just did not seem like a viable. The the odds seemed higher. The, uh, the, the the stakes were higher and the amount of money you could make was absolutely lower with much more effort. Mm-hmm. And so when opportunities started to present themselves to me in comics, I loved comics as much as I loved playing music. And so it was an easy choice to make because I could still play music to whatever degree I want. Um, but I was never going to be able to make a, a living at it at the, at the point that I was at. Mm hmm. And so, you know, I think that like a lot of people have the you know course in their life. Um, and I think, you know, David, not the, um, the guy, Robert McKee, who wrote the book story. Mm-hmm. I think he says at one point in the book, are you in love with the art in yourself or yourself in the art? Mm. Yeah. Meaning like do you project yourself into a situation where you just love the movie industry so much that you want to be in movies even though what you're adept at doing is writing novels. Like you you kind of romanticize it to a certain degree. Exactly. You know, and I think that there are people who can't, you know, like Tom Petty, I said at one point, um, if you can do anything else, do that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but if you can't help but do this thing, and I found more often than not what I was compelled to do and what I had opportunities to do was to work in sequential storytelling and, um, you know, any opportunity to be creative and, and get paid to do it is is something worth jumping at. Yeah, I think it is kind of interesting. Like you were talking about how, you know, everybody has like multiple passions. I find that uh, I've actually been kind of wrestling with that lately because I've spent 
eight years now writing about comics and, you know, podcasting and doing all these different things. And there's a lot of different things that I would also like to write about and touch on. But it's kind of funny, like just the idea of kind of bridging into another field is kind of intimidating because I've spent so long, like building up contacts, building up relationships and building up my kind of knowledge base for this specific field that it's like, can I even do that? Can I even engage with that passion? So it's kind of amazing that you were managed, you managed to shift from, you know, doing live gigs and, you know, performing, opening for our big acts and stuff like that to becoming a comic artist. Yeah. I, you know, I think that part of it is, you know, you end up in this situation where you're not, you're not so fully immersed in a thing that you, and there's, there's definitely a, there's a time window mm -hmm. that's possible where I, and this is, I think some of the things I've seen with friends of mine who are musicians who work full time they've dedicated so much of their resources to it that it becomes like this concord fallacy. Like, well, I've, I've, this is, I put every, every chip I have on this particular bet. I can't back out. You're invested. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, people who I you know, like, my, like my mom is in that situation. She went to law school and it turns out she doesn't like being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Like, but at this point, it's hard to, you know, it, it becomes very, very difficult to make that mental shift. And luckily, I was not at the point where when I was playing music, I had put literally everything I had into that, that aspect of what my life was going to be. And, and I didn't tie my identity to any one aspect of uh, creative output. And I, I think that's, that's the best thing you can do is don't, don't, don't make your identity, um, grow around the sand grain of of one thing it's like who you are as a person is this uh, you know multifaceted thing and just because you may have a passion doesn't mean you, have, you necessarily have to do a thing professionally unless you're so dissatisfied by your professional trajectory that you need that absolutely clean break from it mm -hmm. and i feel like just uh, creating a hierarchy of you know, how, where does this thing fit into your life? Because I, I now I get to play in a rock band with my brother uh, and you know, some other people who are affiliated with comics. Uh, a writer who I really like named Jeremy Barlow is the, the front man. Mm -hmm. nice. And there's zero pressure. So it's super fun to play in this band because none of us particularly care about making money. You know, we just want to play shows and have fun. And that's so much better. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel sad for people who are in the music industry now, you know, for all the reasons I described earlier, but that it's, it's very difficult to get out there and to compete for these spaces. And there's a different type of uh, attention that people have when they're engaging with live music or when they're out in public, it doesn't, it doesn't have the same draw in an environment where you can literally watch any show you want on YouTube. Right. Like if I want to call up, uh, you know, Guns N' Roses, 1991, Indiana, mm -hmm. I can do that. You know, whereas, you know, five, 10 years ago, it just wasn't possible. So you would maybe be more privy to hearing something novel in a space and having a, an experience. And it's harder for people now because I understand people are risk averse and they don't want to waste their time. And what they end up doing, ironically, is wasting a lot of time by reiterating their pleasures over and over again. And I'm not immune from that either. I'm, I'm guilty of it. I watch the same YouTube videos over and over. <laughs> I think it's funny that you mentioned the YouTube thing, just because uh, when I was in, I remember when I was in, I think it was either late high school or early college. I remember my friends and I got together and we watched uh, Stop Making Sense, the the documentary uh, of uh, a Talking Heads performance by, yeah, yeah. oh God, the guy, the guy who directed it just died and I forgot his name. Oh, it's horrible. No. Oh, anyways, but um, yeah, so we, we got together and watched that and it was kind of like this event because my friend got it on DVD and now I, I could just Google that and watch it in like two seconds. So it, <laughs> it is kind of funny how that shifts yeah. and it, it is too. I, I do think that people have a tendency of thinking that they have to set up these silos in their life. It's like, like yeah. if, if you're, if you're going to be an artist, you can't also be in music or like, you know, for me, I went to college for marketing and business management. I didn't mm -hmm. get a degree in writing. I didn't do anything like that. And I remember early on when I started writing, somebody was like, but you didn't write. Like, that wasn't why you went to school. I'm like, so does that matter? Like, I, I can still do it. And I'm relatively decent at it. So it's worked out well for me. But <laughs> it is it is just kind of funny. I think people have a tendency of siloing these parts of their lives uh, just because that's yeah. kind of the way it's expected of them, I guess. 
Yeah, and I, th- I think that that's a that's a general problem in the way that that people tend to think, mm-hmm. and you know, like, and I, I see it manifested in the way that that people draw too. Honestly, there's a, a a tendency that once you find a solution to a problem that works, it's a classic. You have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. Uh, problem, and this it's not just. Uh, you know, this career thing where like, okay, well, I've, I've decided I can play music, so I'm not going to do this other thing. I, d- I don't want to be, you know, like a, a jack of all trades, master of none. So I'm just going to focus on this one thing and that's going to get me through. And, you know, I, I understand the, the sort of practical implications of that. And, and you do sacrifice a kind of micro targeted intensity. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think that it's it's not it's not a universal, mm-hmm. right? Like some people are going to make a, a a major success out of doing one sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And I was talking with some friends last night about this artist who's really great, uh, Jen Bartel. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know. If right? I she write, makes these beautiful things, um, but it's a very it's a specific set of aesthetic choices that get reiterated with a slight degree of variance. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like it's because she's super masterful at this thing. People want to see that masterful thing, um, you know, whereas there are other people who I, I go to because of their ability to shift gears. And I like seeing a multitude of things come out of them, you know, like whether that's Chris Schweitzer, who can do both his historical cartooning, but then he also can make robots out of wood and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, um you know, or Stuart Eminem, who's my yeah. absolute favorite artist who who can do whatever you know, he's capable across every possible range of, of approaches. And I like that too. And I, it's, I don't, I don't think that there's any one, you know, like you said, there's, there's not one path to getting to a, a strange job. Mm-hmm. If you find your thing and I, especially as I get older, I'm, I'm increasingly aware of the prospect that if you if you do too many things in terms of your professional identity, you get lost in the shuffle, especially now. Yeah. It makes sense a little bit more to like, well, you know, don't shut off possibilities of, of what you might make, but be open to going where the flow goes. Like, like you were saying about writing that, okay, well, if, if writing is the thing that catches fire for you, you know, like then follow it and see how far it can go. Yeah, it's funny. I was I was actually going to bring up Stuart uh, Stuart Eminent's work just because when you were talking, I was thinking about the fact that he kind of just a lot of people problem solve based off of you know like page layouts and things like that. It's like a good example of of how versatile he is as an artist is in Next Wave when he you know there there was the one issue where four bush man was in it um i don't know if you've mm. actually read next wave but oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah and like he he emulate the he, uh, four bush man puts all these people into the all the characters into these different realities and like uh mm-hmm. El- elsa bloodstones in this like mike mignola type like right. hellscape basically and and it, it's Stuart doing mignola and then there's Stuart doing this and Stuart doing that and he just he problem solves a uh, solves based off of stylistic answers and right. and i do think I, what, he's such an amazing artist and like you were saying not just in like straight comics i mean i hate uh not to be a total nerd but that guy is a killer birding photographer like his yeah. his stuff is awesome and uh he's, he's he's incredible i think for the very reason that he does not have a particular allegiance to any version of what comics is supposed to be. Sure. There are people who come into comics and they think, okay, well, the gold standard is Jack Kirby. Right. And so that's what they do. Or, you know, the gold standard is Jim Lee. So I'm going to gear everything towards that. Or David Finch or Fiona Staples or whoever it is that somebody fixates on. And I see that with people flat out imitating Stewart's um, choices or his solutions to problems. And I sympathize with that, and I love it when I see somebody make more great art that falls into that category. But it reminds me a lot of when Eddie Van Halen comes out, and then everybody starts doing the tapping thing. Sure. Like, or Yngwie Malmsteen starts playing these, um, you know, crazy fast arpeggios through a Marshall, and then everybody else starts doing that. And it's it's not bad necessarily to appropriate a series of of uh, solutions. But it is bad if you substitute somebody else's judgment for yours. And sure. I think that's true of how people use photo reference or, or you know, anything else that might have that same connotation. 
Yeah, it, it's actually, you know, and that's one of the funny things is uh, I was going to bring this up earlier. One of the things we've talked about in the past that when, I think the very first time I talked to you is about how something that made you actually fall in love with comics was Jim Lee's gatefold cover to X-Men number one. And oh, yeah. I feel like if anybody looked at your work, they wouldn't be like, <laughs> Jim Lee, all right, that's it. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, yeah. there, there, I think there's a difference between being inspired by something and kind of influenced in like kind of the way that you look at art and like actually applying it to your art. And yeah. and, and I think that uh, it's like, you know, you there's nothing wrong if you want to emulate Jim Lee or something like that. Plenty of people have, plenty of people have had a lot of success with it. But at the same time, like you're saying, you can't sacrifice other people's judgment for your own because then what are you? You're just kind of implementing somebody else's game plan and you're not your own person almost, right? Yeah. It, it should, I mean, and that's the thing is like your your influences should be a gateway to different types of thinking. It shouldn't be the mechanical imitation of what they do physically. Mm-hmm. It should be trying to look at their choice making and gain something from that. That's a harder move to make. Sure. It's easier to say, well, what physically do they do? Right. And then how do I duplicate that? But if you look at their choice making, it's like, I don't particularly draw like Terry Dodson, but I think about his choice making all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't um, necessarily, I'm never going to be a person who's able to color like Jordi Belair, but I think about her choice making and I try and analyze it and think, well, you know, if I pass through the Jordi program in my brain, you know, what what would the Jordi AI that I've brought on board <laughs> tell me to do? And so then I'm executing it. I'm passing it through my own filter. Um, but I'm trying to take on board, you know, a series of decision making algorithms I, I see in other people's work. And that kind of analyzing is, is not an easy or necessarily fun thing to do. But But I think it does get you to a different place than just rote copying, uh, which, uh, you know, if if you're at a certain point in your career, you've got to move past that. Right. And like I because I've heard that Stuart Eminem's early stuff feels a lot more like an Adam Hughes Mm. photorealistic kind of deal. And then he just tries other things and 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 forces some other mechanisms. And, you know, like. It, you know, who knows, like if that comes from birding or if it comes from uh, seeing fashion magazines or talking to other artists or I think just just being open to the prospect that, OK, right now you're clinging to a log in the ocean that is your style. And I always tell young artists the same thing, like don't style is not a goal. Right. Style is a, an accumulation of ticks and homage you can't get rid of. It happens to you. It's not a thing to. To, it's not a treasure to be sought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do think uh, Stuart, again, is another interesting example stylistically, just because you look at something like uh, Moving Pictures, like the book he did uh-huh. with his wife, and it, like or, or any of the other stuff that they do together, where it's just like the yeah. more indie stuff. And uh, the average person wouldn't really recognize it. You like look at his art books, like what is it, Centifolia? I think it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you look at like those books, and it's just like a person who reads all new X Men probably wouldn't even recognize him. But <laughs> I, I think he's he. I don't know. He's just an interesting example of somebody yeah. who kind of finds the right solutions for the the right problems. Although yeah. I, I feel like we could totally turn this into a Stuart Eminem question or like oh. podcast. <laughs> uh, I, I do want to actually ask him that ties into all of this, and it's something I've never asked somebody, so I'm very fascinated by your response. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I, I was thinking about kind of you as a person and from my, my limited interactions with you, you, you know, you're you're a smart, kind seeming guy who kinda oh, you know, you, you kinda have like we talked before about your uh the the nice how you wish nice bowler hats would kind of come back so it, it kind of bring back civility and stuff like that. And I feel yeah. like your art kinda has a stately feel to it, uh, especially in tragedy series. Um and, and that that all ties back into the question. How much do you think a person's or an artist's personality influences their art. Like, do you think someone's art is reflective of their personality to a degree? Yeah. I mean, I think as, as much as, you know, you watch somebody walking or how they eat, sure, you know, like those kind of things, it's, it's your, your personality. Like I, and, and part of this is because of the way that I like to read things when I'm not working or a podcast I listen to, are about the nature of how much of your your brain state is configured by your genes and then how much is produced by environment and things like that. But a lot of what we do is not a is not a conscious manifestation of our our selves, you mm-hmm. know, whatever that means. And so um, you're 
choice making. Some of it is conscious and some of it is not. And it's amazing to me when you talk to some artists, it's very intuitive. They just do whatever feels good. And mm -hmm. and sometimes that is is it you'll hear if you're a super talented, lucky person that your brain state is configured in such a way that you don't have to analyze it. Uh, and it just comes out wonderfully. Mm -hmm. Then it's like the movie we were just talking about, Amadeus. You know how much of uh, you know Mozart's work is he responsible for, and how much is a product of historical accident and and being the kind of guy who's got a lucky brain state where it's just configured so that it makes sense. And like he's, I I think that that's true of lots of people, and it's it's a reason to be. Uh, you know, optimistic if you look at it the right way that there's no um, there's no one way that you absolutely have to be configured. And if you can recognize aspects of, of who you are as being a thing you do by default, mm -hmm. yeah, you can you can alter that. You know, like who you are as a person is um, a sort of amorphous cloud of experiences and momentary things and the difference between being reactive and proactive i think makes a big difference mm -hmm. so you can take that to your art and you know something i've been trying to do recently is well i'm i'm a person who is more or less geared towards drawing things from a tradition of uh, studying reference and doing that kind of stuff but when i look at people who i think are really badass like sarah pakelli or mm -hmm. Fiona Staples or this guy Trungles, mm -hmm. where they internalized this vocabulary of, you know, building systems for drawing rather than deeply observing some photograph and trying to get as close to that as they can. It's something that I practice. So I try not to be hemmed in too much by an idea that I have of myself. I'm open to the prospect of, well, you know, that definition can change. It's contextual and it changes over time. Yeah, it, it seems like it, it would almost be valuable for artists to try to get outside their co or comfort zone and try to like approach things from a different perspective that they're not normally used to doing. Yeah, Abs I mean, in comics, absolutely. I think it's a, a matter of trying to focus on how to solve a problem rather than, um, you know, how to stay true to your brand. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's also that's a consideration to have, too. Just like we were saying earlier, if you go where the fire is, if you're the sort of person who OK, well, you're getting a lot of uh, value out of, you know, just drawing, you know, Mark Ryden style baby heads, you know, wearing you know, astronaut helmets with cats and you know, an environment that looks like candy. And people, you, you know, you've got 100,000 Instagram followers and you feel happy doing it, then you've solved a certain problem. And that's not bad to keep following that trail. But if you do start to find that there are problems in in terms of what you can express and the flexibility you have it, you know, like I I used to say uh, when I was in art school that like the degree of craft that you that is necessary to express what you are feeling or thinking internally is all you need, and anything beyond that is is just uh, masturbatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, like, oh, sorry. Go yeah. Ahead. No, no, that's okay. I was just going to say, I, th I think Jen is, is interesting because I, I do really like she she spent a long time cultivating her voice. We talked a lot about it when she was on my podcast and everything. Uh -huh. And and I think that uh, it it really is kind of like the realization of just kind of how she she wants to work and how she like inherently does work. It's just kind of like uh -huh. her, her stylistic voice realized and everything. But I don't know. I mean, it, it is kind of an interesting medium just because everybody is so different in how it manifests. <laughs> it's on the page. Um, I, I actually want to, I know this is kind of a huge turn, but I, I want to go back to uh, one thing we were talking about earlier, which was like, you know, you came from, you came from Cleveland. Uh, yeah. I, I find it kind of funny that you came from Cleveland, which is a city really well, well known for music and for comics, given the fact that Harvey <laughs> Picar is from there and, sure. uh, you know, Bendis actually was from there. You obviously had, I think, uh, Siegel and Schuster were from there. Yep. Um, so you, you have like this, this fabled history, obviously rock and roll hall of fame's there. And then you moved to Portland, a land known for comics and r music. Yeah. Um, and, and it is kind of funny, but one thing that really struck me when I was researching for this interview was something that came out of your interview with Jamie S. Rich for Back in the Gutters. And you yeah. talked about how your ability to flourish in comics comes down to whether or not you have a community. Uh -huh. And, and that's something I've talked about a lot. Like it was, that was a big thing that, uh, Jen and I talked about too, um, I'm yeah. curious, how big of an impact does your community in Portland and more specifically Helioscope have on you as a creator and as a person, really? 
Well, Helioscope was a, you know, when it was Periscope, was a really important place for me when I first started in comics. And I don't know that I'd be working professionally if I wasn't uh, part of that group. Mm -hmm. uh, and more specifically under the, the tutelage of Steve Lieber and Colleen Coover and Jeff Parker, mm -hmm. Paul Guinan, a, a handful of people who were who were responsible for the studio's earlier incarnation and then making it what it is now. Now, I don't spend a lot of time there now in part because my wife and I moved down to Milwaukee, a town that's a little bit south of uh, Portland. And that's where so, Dark Horse is, right? Yeah. And it, it, it costs more to own, you know, to buy a house and it's, it's hard as a freelancer, you got to stay on top of it. So the commute time into the studio and, and, uh, and then setting up and it's, it, you feel like a jerk if you're not being social. Mm -hmm. And so there's reasons why I don't go in there now, but it definitely at a certain specific time in my development. And I would encourage anybody to not just have an online community, but get out there in a space where you're in a room with people. And even if you disagree with them to a certain extent, or you don't overlap perfect perfectly, it gives you social skills that you can then apply in a larger context. Mm -hmm. So whether it's talking to people at conventions, if if you're you know, functioning online, that there's a certain value in that. But I think it needs to be paired with, at least for the time being, um, a, re a real world analog where you have to present yourself in a, a positive and a f affirming way to people who might hire you or collaborate with you it's it's much easier to be behind a screen and to snipe about somebody's choice for representation or I don't like this person and they're a bad person. It's like I think part of that comes out of not having to really overlap with that person and having, mm -hmm. you know, interactions face to face. It's not that those things may not be true, but I think that it's it's uh, it's also equally important to note that this other person is a human being. And you give them room and capacity for growth and people make mistakes. And and when you're in an environment like Heliscope, it feels like I said this to other people like graduate school if nobody ever graduated. <laughs> like you there are there are people whose, you know, egos impact your ability to interact with them, or you you could both be perfectly nice people, but just not have the right combination of things, you know, like a smooth jazz bass player and a person who plays the bagpipes. And like <laughs> It just you're not, not neither one is is inherently bad. It's just they're not a good combination. Sure. And so you learn the skill of loving people at a distance, but realizing that it doesn't have to be a zero sum situation. Like one of my favorite things uh, that Carl Sagan ever offered up is this notion of the excluded middle, mm -hmm. which is that you know we tend to think in binary terms, like oh they're they're with us, they're against us, they're a good person, they're a bad person. They're on our side. No, they're not. You know, like Republican, Democrat. And, right. you know, just like we were talking about earlier with this multitude of, of things, no, no one person that I've ever met uh, can be so narrowly defined by, uh, uh, you know, their online persona. Right. You know, or the work that they make. There's a lot of things that go into to a human being. And I think being in a community where you actually get to be face to face with other people, see what they're doing hear about their choices, if you're genuinely open to the prospect of learning new things and meeting new people and not not judging them based on preconception, um, you'll get a lot out of it. And I recommend it to absolutely everybody, but particularly to comic book artists or people who work generally in an isolated context. I think it's good for your mental health, too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the one thing about having my studio at home that's not great is I end up listening to a lot of political podcasts and it bums me out. Yeah. You know, like I, I don't get worked up. Back. Um, yeah, but more in a way where like I'll, I'll rant to my wife, Lindsay, who will then hear the same thing mm -hmm. 20 with slightly different additions. And, uh, that, you know, you, when you're in a, a, a public setting, particularly like helioscope, you know, the things you talk about, tend to be more focused on the art you make mm -hmm. or with like, where's a good place to get a burrito, stuff like that. It doesn't, um, you know, there's like the civility, the regular propriety of, of interacting with other people in a public space changes your dynamic. And then you don't, 
get fixated in the same way. I got off Twitter for that reason. I just couldn't handle it. Yeah. I actually, I, I think it's kind of funny. I was talking to somebody, a, a creator not that long ago, and we were talking about the difference between like when you go from like Twitter to going to a Comic-Con and how like yeah. the same people interact with each other in completely different ways. Right. And it, it's just like, it, it's, it is much easier to, not that like if, if you have like a legitimate beef with somebody, it's not like you shouldn't be able to, you know, bring it up or something like that. But for the most part, yeah. a lot of the stuff we focus on is kind of petty and minor. And it's like, it, it's, if once you're in person, you're just like, ah, I like this person. I'm going to hang out but i did want to say uh specifically uh you know give you a, a shout out conventions are really hard work and like you guys <laughs> you guys sit there like all day yeah. and i always feel bad because i see people and i'm like oh i want to go up and say hi and then they start eating a sandwich and i'm like i do not want to interfere with their like 30 <laughs> second window where they get a wolf down a sandwich um yeah. but and i'm sure it's hard work for you as well but you've always been one of the most cheerful and like welcoming people i've ever met at a con uh oh, what, what is your secret like h- how do you make it work for you <laughs> Well, I just just like we were just talking about the, the the feeling of isolation that you have when you're working at home alone and you don't get to see people's reaction to things. It's not like being a stand up comic where you try a joke in, in public and it works or it doesn't work. And you have this real time metric of if what you're doing is making people happy or not. Sure. In comics, it doesn't function that way. And the 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 decision making metric of of likes or shares is it has a limited utility, Mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not the kind of thing that tells you genuine, genuinely you can watch anybody scrolling on their phone on Instagram. Yeah. It's passive and mindless, right? The impulse to click a heart is it, it, it could mean something, you know, but you don't know because that's such an, it's such a clumsy implementation of what, whether or not someone cares you don't know the degree to which they care. Mm-hmm. And and so like being in a, a setting at a convention where people are coming up to you and saying, I genuinely like your work. You know, it did this thing for me or thank you or seeing people laugh at a cartoon that I've drawn. Mm-hmm. That's so rewarding. And I'm so thankful to be in my job because I've done uh, shitty retail jobs. I've done uh jobs where i taught guitar lessons i did a job where i worked at a pizza parlor for like a year and a half Mm -hmm. and getting to draw for a living is a tremendous gift and it's made possible by people who spend some of their entertainment dollars on a thing that requires some actual effort Mm -hmm. on their part going to a store getting a book sitting down reading the book it's you know like i understand why video games and movies are generally more popular than comics because they're mostly a, a passive experience, mm-hmm. right? Like uh, what is required of you and the feedback you get in the case of a movie is like, well, you just sit and somebody takes you on a ride and it's it's really thrilling and you can see yourself, you can project with very little effort because all those decisions are made as thoroughly and with as many cues as possible. And a video game is similar in the sense that well, there's a lot of writing and development that goes into it, and they try and make the choice making as as easy as possible. But then they also reward your brain with uh, serotonin and dopamine every time you push a button and successfully pull off a task, mm-hmm. right? And so comics aren't like that. It's it's uh, it's not exactly like reading a novel, but it's not quite like re- watching a movie either. Mm-hmm. It's got a balance of passive and active requirements. And uh, I just I'm super thankful to people who see the value in it in the same way that I do and go out of their way to you know reward me on some level financially for doing it. I don't like to call people fans because I feel like it's presumptuous. I call people readers. Mm-hmm. I try really hard to make that distinction because to say somebody is a fan, I th- like I feel like you got to be at a, a level where you're Bono or something <laughs> like or people are fanatics or they're genuinely it's like, yeah, people people read my stuff. I don't want to say to what degree someone likes it. You know, like I think if you're Babs Tar, you get to say you have fans. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, like, or like get, or like Rob Liefeld. I saw his table at Emerald City Comic Con. That dude yeah. had lines. Yeah, you know, like and, and there are people who I feel like that is that is a, a well earned thing, you know, and and I, I don't begrudge other people 
using the term if they feel comfortable with it because for some people that's legitimately true mm-hmm. and like you seeing you know kevin wada and how people react to his stuff mm-hmm. that guy's got fans you mm-hmm. know like a, and it's it's well earned yeah i i uh i i will say i i do appreciate the, like the level of depth you put into your work though just because uh, the tragedy series uh, for listeners that don't know a tragedy series was compiled into a book and in the in the front of the book you put a puzzle in there and the, the <laughs> puzzle vexed me to no end and yeah. I couldn't defeat it but I really appreciated it it actually made me like I don't know I love that so much I, I love puzzles so it worked out great for me but at the same time I, I never actually was able to complete it. <laughs> Um, no, nobody has solved it, and I think I made it too hard. <laughs> I was like, seriously, I would, I would go down. And I was, I was laying in bed, and I was reading it. And I was like, oh, there's a puzzle. So I got paper, and I started writing stuff down. And my wife was so confused as to what I was doing, and I was just like, I, I have to do this. I, it's, I have a puzzle in front of me. <laughs> um, but anyways, it was very difficult. But uh, so I, I want to talk about your art and how you work for a little bit. Um, okay. For, for listeners that don't know, what what is your process on? like an issue of Autumn Lands. You're mostly traditional, right? Yeah, but I, it's a combination of traditional and digital. And, you know, that has its own pitfalls mm-hmm. uh, in that uh, my Cintiq just died recently. And that's a piece of equipment that uh, is expensive. And you you don't realize how used to it you are until you don't have it anymore. Right. And so uh, typically what I will do is I'll get a script from whoever is writing for me. Uh, at the the moment, I'm working on a Beast of Burden for Dark Horse and a Rick and Morty script uh, for Oni. And then I do a backup feature for Cave Carson for DC. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, like so like any script I get. I, I tend to like to thumbnail on paper mm-hmm. because it's easy. It keeps it fairly simple. I use a, a limited number of tools. Um, and then I just try and do as much storytelling problem solving as possible. I look at the script. I try and think about what their intent is. And then I try and think about what is the clearest but also most interesting way that I can frame this so that there is no confusion about what's being implied. Mm-hmm. So I do that. I usually talk over the thumbnails with an editor or the person who writes and uh, I will take their notes because I'm absolutely appreciate the collaborative nature of of the medium. Mm -hmm. And then based on those notes, I will scan the thumbnails, put them into uh, Manga Studio, do a refined pass and that will be my pencils. Mm -hmm. I print out those pencils and then I ink over the top. And then I add wash tones and depending on whether it's a thing that I have to color or if it's a thing that I'm sending off to a colorist, uh, there's a whole other set of processes. But it tends to be analog, digital, analog, and then digital again if the coloring is involved. Yeah. I say I use whatever tool makes the most sense for efficiency and where how many changes have to be made. Mm -hmm. So I know that I'm kind of a messy person when it comes to penciling or doing structuring on paper. So digital really helps with that because you can make a bunch of decisions and fix them. Um, and then coloring is the same way where like you can make, you know, certain choices, but then you might find yourself in a position where you then have to change them all. Because if you're working on a licensed property, like, well, in this instance, you know, because Rick is on planet Glaxon 12, it changes his hair to purple. So you got to change all that, mm-hmm. you know, like, it's, uh, but if, uh, you know, like if you do it in watercolor, okay, well, you just created a whole new series of problems for yourself. Mm-hmm. And so the ability to fix a thing or alter a thing uh, is genuinely helpful. And I see why people go fully digital, but I just I don't feel comfortable with it yet. It may be I tried a couple issues of Autumn Lands and I I didn't like it. Yeah, it seems like uh, it seems like inking is kind of really where you kind of get everything laid down in full. It's like if if your pencils are pretty rough and I, 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 I kind of hear from people that I talk to that inking is one of the parts that can be the most difficult in figuring out once in digital because it's trying to get the digital to recreate what you do with a, a brush or a pen or something. Is, is that kind yeah. of what you found? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the problem is that it is a variable size, mm-hmm. right? And so like your connection to, and some people are better at this than others. I, I see the way that Fiona Staples does it is amazing mm-hmm. to me because she keeps it really consistent. It feels organic. And, and, um, you know, of course, like it's easy, easier to keep 
all, it all in the family if you're going to be doing the digital coloring too, which he does. And so I, I tend not to like the computer space for that because it just is really hard to know which line is going to carry the same weight. Whereas on a piece of paper, it's right in front of me. Yeah. I, I can see exactly what the line weight is and know whether it's good or bad. And I like the idea that there's a built-in limitation on how much you can do on paper. You then don't have to fall down the rabbit hole of being able to control Z every choice you right. make. And so it's uh, like, do you ever see these guys uh, and ladies who do slack lining? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's right. like huge like, in Alaska. Like the, right near right. my house is a big slack lining spot. So they just set up the slack line and, and some, in some cases over really high dangerous stuff. And so it's, there's a, a clarity of thought. It's not exactly the same level of, of risk and danger, right? But like <laughs> you're still – you're still trying to, and this is what I like about inking on paper, is it forces a, a level of focus that when I'm working on a computer, if, if there's aspects to that that feel fairly disposable or not concretized. And I like I like drawing on paper because of of where it puts me mentally. Yeah. Well, it, it requires more like precision of thought to how you approach it and everything. And one thing I think is is – this this is just the, the here's the Philistine layman in me. Like I, I, I still I watch like video of artists work and I just think you guys are wizards, not only because of how good you are, but also how the, I just don't know how you don't get ink all over you. I, maybe you do. And it's just like it's been like doctored out or you just start doing like the show work or something. But I was watching the back in the gutters interview you did and you were like inking. Yeah. And I, w I was actually kind of curious about how you ink because it seemed like you inked progressively upwards. It, just from a straight structural <laughs> standpoint, is there a specific direction you ink in or is it just kind of based off feel? Uh, well, it's based on, you know, there's certain limitations for how you move your arm. And I learned that in part from watching the way that Ron Chan will ink. And he'll do that on a computer, mm -hmm. too, where he'll he'll in, in Manga Studio, you can do this this hotkey combination where you can rotate it, which one direction or another. And he will rotate a page almost fully around so that he can get the line that he wants. Mm. And, you know, you, cartoonists have been doing that for a really long time. So if, if it's easier for you to make a smooth line, uh, say, left to right, if you're right handed, than it is to go right to left, uh, then you'll you'll do that. And you might have to flip the paper completely around to make that happen. So it really comes down to, you know, just trying to be thoughtful about what kind of line you want mm -hmm. to make. And then knowing your body and your approach to drawing well enough that you then uh, know how to configure the paper or yourself so that you can pull that off. Mm -hmm. I thought one thing that you said to Jamie that was really interesting was how you said that you, you sometimes really hate your drawings until you get to midtones. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a big deal for your work. Anybody who sees your work uh, that like knows art a bit knows that. But uh, so first off, for listeners... What are midtones? And second off, how do you really feel like they kind of change and you know impact your work? So there, there, you know, there are people who are very, very skilled with pure black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chris Somney, I think, is a guy like that. Unbelievable, yeah, yeah, he's incredible. He's he's you know, like we were talking about Amadeus earlier. Like, talk about Mozart and Salieri. I never feel more like Salieri <laughs> than <around> Somney. <laughs> yeah. And, it also happens that he is he's not a buffoon like Amadeus Mozart. He's he is a wonderful, a sweet person, mm -hmm. you know, like and there's there's like there's a, a host of, uh, you know, well behaved, you know, genteel fellows like that, uh, you know, Ms. Mitch Jareds or uh, Evan Shaner. Mm -hmm. Chris Somney, Fiona Staples is like that where they're just so nice and like, oh, man. I wish you were a jerk <laughs> <laughs> so that I could just rage at, at uh, you know, you got to be terrible to be this good and soul, soul, <laughs> devil, what a monster. Uh, so, you know, like there are people who do that kind of nice, straight black and white stuff where they, they create these relationships that are based on that binary relationship. And then there are people who can use tones that are somewhere in between a series of grays or a series of, uh, you know, I don't know if they call them like Ben day dots. Mm -hmm. Like you look at somebody like James Heron. Yes. Uh, his work is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. That guy, uh, talk about a wizard. Like uh, I see his stuff and his cartooning is unbelievable. His use of the, um, uh, comics, like the, uh, the, the dots that I forget what it's called. There's some, there's some other name for it. Um, 
Oh, I, I, I know what you're talking about. Like what the, the actual like fancy name. I feel like yeah, it's, it's like a pointillism. Yeah, no. so they're like a series of, of, um, of equally spaced dots that you can uh, do a, a rubbing onto a, a drawing and it produces a mid-tone mm. uh, pattern because your eye blends them together into a uniform gray. Mm-hmm. And so you can see it in classic comics. And I use a watercolor wash because scanners are good enough now that they can pick up a lot of different subtleties. And part of the reason that people did things like feathering or cross hatching back in the day was that the machines, the means of production were not subtle enough to pick up or even maybe even to print uh, a gray tone, but they could print some combination of dots or hash hatched lines or something of that sort. And so it's funny to see people in a, in the 21st century using techniques that came out of, you know, having to respond to etching technology that dates from like the 19th century. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's a goofy thing. I mean, like I do it too, because there's, there's an aesthetically satisfying aspect to it, but I don't, I find that I'm not satisfied with just the, the black and white component. And maybe that comes from my training as a painter um, or a lack of confidence in the lines I put down. But I like to see, to have that range of things makes it feel more sculptural for me. It makes it feel more dimensionally. Mm-hmm. I feel uh, like a, I feel like a lot of my artists actually, or my my artists, my favorite artists use uh, like tones in that way. Like I really like Declan Shalvey's stuff. And he's, oh yeah, he's, just about to say Declan. Is yeah, a he's master gr- of that too. He's so great with the ink washes and everything like that. And they add. I think that a lot of that stuff isn't really kind of showy, but it, it adds a lot of uh, depth to it that, that you don't really even think about. But it adds a lot to the page. And uh, I don't know. I, I yeah. think it's really interesting. You weren't referring to duotone, were you? No. Oh, that might be another name for it too. Uh, I mean, I'm sure, there are people who I'm sure you know, like listening who are like, well, "How do you not know this?" And like, <laughs> it depends on the day. I know it some days, and then I forget it other days because it's not a thing I actively use. But you know, part of the reason that I don't use that or I don't use really elaborate hatching uh, is because it produces a certain textural aspect that I don't always want. I I prefer the fluid flow of it where uh, this friend of mine uh, who who is a scientist at the Paul Allen Brain Institute, she studies visual processing. And this is like part of my philosophy of inking comes down to things that she's taught me or things that I've learned from books about how you process information visually. And she said that you have this it's a type of eye movement. It's called a saccad, I think is how you pronounce it. Mm hmm where your eye will alight on different things. And as you move around, you stop at these nexus points. And when you create a hatch marked pattern, then you create, you know, 10,000 little nexus points that stops your eye at Mm. the juncture of those lines. That's a different type of gray implication. That's Mm -hmm. a different type of processing in your brain than if you just have a flow of gray ink. And the same thing with the, with the Bende dots, It, it produces this, um, this, this, And it's not necessarily perceptible to you, but it has a different psychological impact than if you're just using uh, a more fluid way to achieve a similar effect. Yeah. Yeah. Like holds your eye in a more significant way. Like it keeps you there as opposed to like the washes, which just kind of feel right or like an organic part of the of what's going on but i mean yeah. it, like a, a great example of somebody who's like duotone was art adams and he was like man that guy that guy just oh he's amazing yeah. i i do think it's funny you keep bringing up all these artists that are just like my favorite artists i feel like we have the exact <laughs> same taste in art <laughs> probably yeah um but uh i so i want to ask just a couple more questions before oh, we, sure. we, we jump into uh five questions about benjamin dewey the the person um i, I one of the things we talked about before in a previous interview we'd done was you talked about how the mindset of the work matters more than the tools and uh-huh. how having like the best pen or tablet in the world isn't going to make you a much better artist necessarily and i i love the one example of something that you used at least back when you did this back in the gutters interview is you had these chobani yogurt containers that you put in for ink refills <laughs> and i thought that yeah. was great I, I thought it was a it, like my wife would be so proud of that she's an architect and she uses all these like random things to help her problem solve <laughs> um how important do you think it is for artists to learn that that it isn't necessary necessarily the tools that define their work. I think that it's important early on yeah. to to get that sense that you don't have to have the best of the best. It's not about lifestyle. It's not about 
you know, putting yourself in a position where, okay, well, I've given myself all the best tools. So now I'm, I'm a pro. You know, I, I see that with guitars all the time. I used to teach at a guitar store and every people who come in with the most badass guitar that was available, mm-hmm. just the coolest stuff. And uh, oftentimes these are people who did not spend a ton of time practicing uh, and who are just wondering, like, well, what if I what if I get this pedal? What if I plug into this amp? Will I sound like this person? <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, no, no, you won't. You know, because uh, the the person, uh, you know, like, you know, Dimebag Daryl is not an amazing guitar player because he's got a guitar with lightning bolts on it. He's a uh, amazing, or you know, was amazing because he practiced like crazy, mm-hmm. and that part is not glamorous. And I think we do a disservice to young artists and to each other if we mystify the nature of what makes a person good. And some people like, you know, I guess Malcolm Gladwell is a big proponent of this 10,000 hours right. notion. Um, and that's true. But it's also it's not just 10,000 hours of blank practicing. It's 10,000 hours of of also thinking about it, talking with other artists, figuring out what's endemic to you as a creator and then after you start to get a sense of what it is you want to be able to do and you start running up against challenges that prevent you from making the sort of line you want, then you can find a tool that helps you execute that thing. Mm -hmm. I just recently found these zebra brushes, I think because Jonathan Case, who's another artist I love. Oh my God. He's, I have a a commission from him and I I love his stuff so much. The guy is, he's like a perfect human. He's, he's amazing. And he's just nice. Yeah, he's super fun to hang out with. He's an incredibly courageous person, uh, uh, you know, a deeply humble guy, uh, but who also has a full understanding of the scope of his gift, too. He's an he's a incredible guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in part, some of the tools I've used come from him or from, you know, Colleen Coover or from uh, interns who passed through Helioscope when it was Periscope. So you you find stuff eventually that helps you execute these things, but that shouldn't be the way in which you um, you dictate your choices. It's the same thing as like, do you rely too much on reference? Do you rely too much on trying to copy the work of somebody else? Any of these things that substitute uh, your decision making for that of a tool or for a tradition or any of these other things are things that I encourage young people, uh, you know, or developing artists to avoid. Mm-hmm. because it, because it, 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 it short circuits the process that gets you to the point where you do make good decisions and you find what your voice really is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I do think it's funny. Uh, I, I actually, I wrote something yesterday cause, uh, just like two weeks ago, I think it was, was like my eighth anniversary of writing about comics. And I've been mm-hmm. w- weirdly coinciding with that. I've had a bunch of questions from like listeners and readers and stuff about how I, you know, figured out what I was doing. And I, yeah. I, do, I do think one of the things I, I told all of them, and I wrote this in the piece, like one of the biggest drivers for me is uh, just doing it and then uh, failing a whole lot to find out <laughs> what the right answer is. Because uh, you really kind of have to put in the reps, not just because it makes you better, but because you find out what are not your strengths. And I think that's something people forget about it. Uh, because I like, when I first started writing, I was not very good. But mm-hmm. I eventually became pretty good at it because I I didn't put in 10,000 hours, but I, I put in a lot of time. And I think that there was a lot of value in that. And I think people, you know, a lot of times you learn a lot about a person based off of what they do when, uh-huh. when they're faced with those hardships, you know. But, yeah, that, that's the nature of, of building any aspect of human characters. Unfortunately, uh, our disappointments are as much a part of it as the things where we feel successful. And then if you don't have to come up against challenges... If you don't have to um, deal with uh, limitation on your ability to execute your your dream or your ideas, that tends to make for people who are uh, disconnected to from compassion and um, get really frustrated when they don't get absolutely what they want. Mm-hmm. And uh, those kind of people are however talented they may be, I think that they, they oftentimes will burn out either because they're an unpleasant person and people don't want to have to deal with a diva. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, or, um, they just, uh, don't get along 
you know, or, or don't know how to put in the time necessary to do a thing that requires some discomfort. Yeah. And anybody who's worked in monthly comics knows that it is not a comfortable process. It's not easy. Uh, and yeah, like if you're a fancy pants who's never had to compromise on their art at any point, you're not going to you're not going to function. You won't flourish. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, one of the things that people forget is, like, you, you have all these processes and you have all these things you want to do and you have this idyllic version of, of how you want to do your art. But a lot of that goes out the window once you actually have to yeah. start meeting deadlines. And, yeah. And, and, that, and that's tricky. But I, I did want to ask the, the last, like, uh, like kind of a, approach question I had was, uh, you yeah. know, in, in, in an issue, in every issue of the Autumn Lands, there's, like, a storybook entry that kind of comes in a few pages in that kind of introduces like it's a majestic introduction to the whole and you paint that right yes and so but in the, in the rest of the issue you're colored by Jordia belair Jordi belair goddess of all colorists and fantastic <laughs> right. human being um yeah obviously it's a hugely different approach but how much of a change is it when you're coloring yourself in some capacity versus working with somebody like Jordi? oh well you know it's, to a certain extent there's kind of a firewall between what i do on the painting and what Jordi does yeah. because for reasons that Kurt has described, but has not necessarily articulated to the the readers yet, um, those stories operate in an, a context outside of what we're seeing from oh. the regular uh, from the regular goings on of the book. Mm -hmm. And so it's a meta uh, connection to the actual events of the story, but it can be more flexible. And so. I just try and make you know the best image that I can, given the um, exchanges that Kurt and I have about options I've provided him to look at in my thumbnails. And so Jordy sometimes will make choices based on on what I've done because typically I'll do the painting before she colors the book. Mm -hmm. But she has such a strong sense of of what functions for storytelling and what she wants to see that. I don't know that anything I do is going to have an impact on, on Jordy's <laughs> sense of coloring. She's a, a singular talent. Yeah. And I think about how she functions, and I, I feel so lucky to be one of her uh, many collaborators. And that's, that's the thing that I'm, to a certain extent, a little jealous of colorists in that they can uh, – do a bunch of different projects and it's harder when you're a penciler inker uh, the the main draftsman on a book that you're committed to that and so if you're lucky you can pull off one book a month and colorists and writers are a little bit more flexible and so uh jordy gets to experiment and try a lot of things like talk about ten thousand hours if she's working on 11 books right a year which is not uncommon she gets to try lots of different color experiments and work with different artists. And um, I, I feel like it would be like being a, a guitar player who has to play with Lady Gaga. And then you have to play in, uh, you know, some super badass straight ahead jazz band. And then you know, they do for the Billboard Country Music Awards. And like she's she's doing that. And she's she was ridiculously skilled before she started working on every book that comics has to offer. But now she's, um, you can't catch her. She's in the stratosphere. It is kind of interesting how that works. I mean, I, not like, you know, you, you're doing what you love and everything like that, but I, I often feel for artists because you kind of get locked into doing a story of a certain type for a prolonged period of time. If you have a project like uh -huh. Bottomlands, uh, while like other people, like you get a, like somebody like Jordy, you look at her colors and she gets to apply completely different approaches to the Autumn Lands that yeah. she does versus Batman versus, yep. uh, oh God, I'm totally somehow blanking, like Pretty Deadly or or any number of oh, other yeah. projects she works on or like Injection, you know, for example. Yeah. And, and she constantly gets to showcase that, you know, writers get to do the same thing. You know, today I feel like it's a sci-fi day or tomorrow it's a Western <laughs> fantasy day and things like yeah. that. And it's like you kind of get locked into that. But it is kind of interesting, you know, because Autumn Lands is currently kind of, you know, figuring some stuff out and scheduling. At least, like, Beasts of Burden, I can't wait to see you work on that. I love Beasts of Burden. And <laughs> and that, that's pretty great. But also Rick and Morty, that's something I wouldn't normally expect for you. But it's cool that you're getting to dabble in between, um, you know, while yeah. the Autumn Lands is sorting things out. I I had to I had to make a certain adjustment at a, at a at a point where I realized that, you know, Kurt had certain commitments that were not going to make it possible for him to turn out stuff 
on a schedule that would m- make it possible for me to just make my living from working on autumn lands. Mm-hmm. And part of that is because he's got, he's got 30 years of, of things to maintain. Right. And there are people who ask him a lot of questions and people want his knowledge and they want his input and he's working on Astro city and he's doing a bunch of other things. He's got projects that he wants to do. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, for the longest time I thought, okay, well I'm gonna put all my eggs in the basket of autumn lands and that's what I'll do. And when I realized that that's not necessarily fair to me and it's not fair to Kurt because that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on him to only do that thing. Yeah. And pump out uh, scripts. Right. And you know, it's a commitment that we made together, but I also know that the nature of life is not that cut and dry. Like things come up, you know, whether you have, you know, <laughs> health issues or any other things that can occur. And that happens to everybody. And so I just in in around January decided I was going to take on other things and I have my own projects I want to do. I miss being, uh, having an authorial voice like I did on tragedy series. Mm -hmm. And you got, I think that it's a part of comics that doesn't get talked about a lot is that you got to put yourself out there. It's, it's, you can watch it. Like i I relate a lot of stuff now to drag race because I'm a big fan. Thanks to my friend, Terry Blass, Mm -hmm. um, that you can be a nice person and you can like, you know, like one week they're collaborating in a challenge together and the next week they're against each other. Mm -hmm. And it's not like that in comics. You know, I feel like a rising tide lifts all boats and I, there's, there's only one person in comics I've ever met who was a jerk Mm -hmm. who I wish, um, I don't want to wish ill on them, but I don't, I, I don't feel like comics is enhanced by this person's right contribution. They were really weird and homophobic to me for no good reason. And, uh, um, you know, like, but for the most part, I feel like it's, it's, a uh, you just got to make your own space and you got to function with other people, mm-hmm. uh, is for as long as it's mutually beneficial. And as soon as you get to a point where you realize, uh, it's not going to be easy uh, to keep going, it it can be sad as a as a as a reader sometimes when things break down. But and like now, after having been in the industry, I, I I see how that goes. And unless you have a runaway success with something like The Walking Dead or Saga, yeah, you know it's it can be really difficult to sustain uh, enthusiasm in a project. And uh, I feel like all of us, because we're freelancers, have the temptation to want to bounce around to different things or try other things because you can, in working in that isolation, lose track of where you are. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to try doing an issue of Rick and Morty. I want to try doing Beast of Burden. And it it allows me to flex my creative muscles a little bit and, and prep for the possibility of doing my own stuff again. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it probably expands your voice a little bit because you start like, you know, Rick and Morty is a completely different approach than something like Autumn Land. So maybe you're going to find something out about yourself. You're like, <laughs> maybe I like this stuff. Maybe this is better angle for me or something. But uh, so uh, before we go, I wanted to close with five questions about Benjamin Dewey, okay. the person instead of I'll the artist. Be, I'll try and be succinct. I know I tend to prattle on. No, no, it's okay. Uh, this is the most important question I could ever ask a person. So I'm fine <laughs> if you prattle on. Uh, okay. it, previously, uh, when I did a five questions interview with you at Emerald City Comic Con, you talked about how your favorite person, your, one of your, who you would have as your comic book roommate was a person that you go to brunch with and you'd have pancakes with him. Uh, it, so I take that to admit that you're a, a breakfast fan. We're recording this during brunch. What's your ideal breakfast meal, including beverage? Oh, man. So uh, if I could go anywhere, there's a place in Chicago called the Bongo Room, which is the best. (laughs) You were talking about how because you live in Alaska, uh, you don't have access to good fruit. Yeah. I feel like that is like the rest of the world when they have pancakes if they're not in Chicago. (laughs) Like, Like, it's not that there aren't decent ones you can find. They're fine. But it's a whole other world. You mm-hmm. know, go to the bongo room. That place will blow your mind. Uh, I guess I really like, I would, I would pair that high end pancake experience with, uh, um, a budget coffee experience. There's mm-hmm. a, a place here in town in Portland called Tom's, which is my favorite place to go and get what I like to call dishwater coffee. Mm. Uh, and I, they brew a, a brand that I really like, but they brew it in such quantities that it's, uh, you know, it's it's not that they're doing some artisanal thing. Right. 
So I like the way that they brew Boyd's Coffee at Tom's on the corner of 39th and Division in Portland. So that would be my ideal combination is Bongo Room Pancakes and Boyd's Coffee at Tom's. I love it. That is a that is a very specific combination, but it's perfect. <laughs> so follow-up breakfast question. Portland has a lot of great breakfast spots. What's your uh-huh. favorite? Oh, there's, so there's a place called the Country Cat that is is amazing. If, I feel if like anything, I've been there, actually. Yeah, and it's, if anything can rival the Bongo Room in Chicago, it's the Country Cat. That place is rad, and it's marred only by a uh, graffiti of Guy Fieri uh, <laughs> above their grill, who I think that must have been contractual. Like, well, you can come in and do a profile of our shop, but I get to spray paint my face above your cooking hood. <laughs> it's like like the most beautiful person you've ever seen with a really bad tattoo. Oh my God. Come on. What are you doing? (laughs) A slap in nature in the face. Like, so uh, the country cat is amazing. That's its only, that's its only bad feature is this weird guy Fieri staring down at you. Um, I also like a place called Zell's. That Uh place is awesome. And it's very charming. And they give you these scones, Uh, a place called the city state where my best friend and I go to breakfast on a regular basis. Um, and then I like Tom's because I, every time I go in there, I know it's going to be fine. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's like, like the reliable, like, it's the, com- the comfort food level. Right. It's like a greasy spoon. And I like that about it. That's my favorite. Do you feel like you, ju- this is not one of my questions, but do you feel like you judge a breakfast spot based off of its pancakes? Or is that just like the bongo room is so insurmountably great that it's unfair to judge <laughs> other places based off that? Oh yeah. That's, that's the, the second one. Okay. You know, like it's a, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I tend not to be picky and I'm not a foodie. Like people who are really into food and they go get tapas and they are willing to try, you know, creme brulee and crusted chicken wings at a Thai fusion. Like that's not me. Uh, I'm a guy who likes staples. I, I like if it's if it's mediocre and there's a fair amount of it. I prefer that to uh, in quotes, really amazing and a tiny thing presented on a plate mm-hmm. in a fanciful way. Sure. That's. That's not my bag. So gotcha. like, like how much coffee do they bring me? Do they have veggie sausage? Uh, you know, like are the scrambled eggs fine? You know, like it's enough. I always say that a greasy spoons merits is uh, totally based on how often they refill your coffee mug. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's a very important thing. Uh, so next question in your back in the gutters interview, you said the elephant seal is your favorite animal. What makes it your favorite? <laughs> um, that it looks powerful and silly, uh, but also dangerous. And it just, I had never, nobody was talking about them. You know, when you get these children's books and they're like, oh, and here's the giraffe and here's the lion and here's, uh, you know, nature's cruelest monstrosity. That's also its its fiercest foe. Like it, it just looks so intense. Mm-hmm. And when they're bellowing out and they're breathing their hot air, gross garbage mouths into the <laughs> The cold air of of the cold climates in which they're at, like, oh, man, that thing looks so intense. And I just I'm always amazed when evolution selects for things to make a creature look a certain way or at least doesn't prevent it. Mm -hmm. What a weird series of choices and, and historical accidents produced this freaky thing. It really does just look like a seal that like the nose just kept going. (laughs) <laughs> right. I'm like, yeah, okay. You can stop. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh, we messed up a match. They're all scarred up because they bite each other with their gross mouths. They're just fascinating. They just blow my mind. Yeah. That's a, that's a fantastic pick. Uh, next, you obviously have a serious music background. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm always curious about th- this question for anybody, but what is your favorite thing to listen to while working? And is it even music? It's not music. Uh, I like to listen to uh, political podcasts and foreign policy podcasts. And I, I can't do that all the time, obviously, particularly in the climate we're in now. It's uh, uh, overwhelming. Uh, yeah. But uh, there's a handful that I really like. Uh, the guys on Crooked Media uh, who oh. do Pod Save America and Pod Save the World and Love It or Leave It. I like those shows a lot. Started listening to DeRay's, DeRay McKesson's podcast, Pod Save the People. Mm-hmm. I like uh, Primary Concerns. Uh, I like foreign policy editors roundtable. I liked it in particular when this guy, David Rothkopf mm. was, was hosting it and he, he stepped down as editor of foreign policy. So now he, I, I don't know exactly what he's doing now, but he wrote a book that I just listened to on audio audible 
is called I think Questions for Tomorrow. It's a it's a book about like what questions should we be asking in the 21st century as institutions that uh, were built of conflicts that came out of the 21st century or 20th century and before. As those things start to age, you know, you have these organizations like NATO or uh, the World Bank or these other things. Like, how do you modernize them mm-hmm. as countries are getting more and more overlapping? And those questions are are interesting to me. And uh, I, I that's partially why I like listening to that stuff. It's especially if you work in isolation like I do, hearing smart people talk about relevant things uh, is 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 a uh, not always a breath of fresh air, but it can it can feel like you're engaged in a different type of social enterprise. Yeah, and it makes you feel like a larger part of a community and everything. Yeah. So uh, lastly, in, in, in an interview we did on Sketched, you underlined the importance of making space for downtime as an artist and how it's much healthier to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. So my question is, what is your favorite activity to unwind with as a break or as a way to close your day? <laughs> uh, so... I like to, if I can, set aside a little time to play some Xbox. I, I will take frequent break, breaks and play uh, mandolin on my front step. Uh, I like to hang out with my brother, Gabe Fisher is his name. Mm-hmm. And uh, he comes over and we sometimes will play Skyrim or we've we've recently started to go back in and play uh, Mass Effect because I never finished Mass Effect 3. I just, you know, you, know, you work in comics full time. Right. You just don't have the the hours and when i hear people are on like oh my second or third playthrough i'm like wow i <laughs> that's amazing like you're like yeah it's, it's it's so like i i have a variety of things i like to do i like to read before bed i listen to a lot of books i um i like to yeah i like to play my mandolin a lot recently and then my wife Lindsay and i will watch uh, the show property brothers oh right because we bought our house, but we we spent all the money we had to get it. And so now we're in a position where I can't necessarily afford to do anything. Right. Except just keep making the house payment. So when I watch other people successfully revamp a house in you know, like it, the timeline on the show is like six weeks. But you see it play out over the space of an hour. It's so cathartic. It's so mm-hmm. enjoyable because like we're walking around on subflooring that hasn't been. Uh, improved for I don't know how long. It's just we can see the subfloor. Yeah, that's what it's like. We want to fix her upper, uh, and so I like to watch that show. It's it's predictable in a lot of ways, but I also like that it has enough variance that I might encounter surprises or I might learn something. It's it's a perfect combination of engaging and relaxing it's great that's awesome I, I i don't know if i could watch a show like that even though i do kind of like those types of shows just because my <laughs> wife and i also bought a house and we yeah. have been going through a process of having to deal with like a warranty through a contractor which turns out people really don't like working off of warranty and we've had an extremely negative experience and oh, so yeah. yeah it's it's just been kind of weird but at the same time like those shows are it is it is kind of weird how you watch that or like house hunters or whatever yeah and like you just there's something oddly relaxing about it and i don't right. know what it is I, th- I think you know it's like live vicariously through people who have set aside a hundred thousand dollars you know, for the development of making their living space more comfortable. Yeah. And so you, you get to see this stuff play out in a way that it's it's like it's almost pornographic. Where it's, <laughs> it's like aspirational. Right. It's like I wouldn't make that choice. But ah, that's intriguing. Like, yeah, it's kind of exciting. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, I there's something something about that that uh, I think we all have some variation on that. For some people, it's sports or something like that where you know the the disappointments or the exciting elements of it might be different for everybody but the vicarious uh, mm-hmm. potential is is there yeah absolutely that is all i have for you ben thank you so much for coming on this has been fun it was great uh but yeah thank you so much yeah thanks for having me thanks for listening to this week's episode of off panel with artist benjamin dewey you can find him on twitter at benjamin dewey on his website at benjamindewey.tumblr.com, on his Etsy at etsy.com slash shop slash Benjamin Dewey, on Instagram at Benjamin Dewey, and his work in comics like the Autumn Lands, Tragedy Series, and his upcoming work in Rick and Morty and Beasts of Burden. If you're a fan of the show, there's some big news. Off Panel now has a Patreon. 
you like the show and want to support it, consider backing on Patreon at patreon.com slash off panel. There are fun rewards and insider information you can get if you do. Big thanks to all of my existing patrons, including Dan Lee, Kat McKenzie, Lou Iovino, Christopher Carter, Nicholas Kesslake, Brian Dickerson, Greg Rucka, Ryan Mail, Adam Heifel, Nicholas Gardner, Andrew Corgan, Fiona Staples, Chris Morris, Johan Barander, Chris O'Halloran, Mark Abnett, Matt Pataglia, Alec Bernal, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Dimonakos, Norbert, Niccolo, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics and Art in San Francisco. Don't forget to like the show on Facebook at Slash Sketched, that's S-K-T-E-C-H-D, follow on Twitter at, at Sketch Comic, or follow me at, at Slice Fried Gold. Want more from Off Panel? Subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher, and give the show a rating or review while you're at it. A quick thanks to the band Wolfpack, whose excellent track outro from their album Vol Milch opens and closes the show now. Give them a listen as they're totally rad. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode.